Now it's time to introduce um, our third and final speaker for today. Some people would say that this fellow needs no introduction, but like we saw with all those hands that were raised earlier that didn't know anything at all about the Belgium UFO scene, it's important that I do my best to try and give you some brief background about Tony Dodd, whom I first met way back in the late 70s when I was investigating UFO reports in and around the North Yorkshire region. At the time, Tony was a police sergeant who had just quite literally turned a corner one evening with colleagues alongside him and come across this incredible UFO that was unlike anything that Tony or indeed his colleagues had ever seen before. There have been many, many experiences and sightings since. But on that fateful night in, near Skipton all those years ago, I think Tony took a decision that when the time came for him to retire from the North Yorkshire Police Force, he would try and get to the bottom of this. And my God, over the last few years has he tried. Tony left the North Yorkshire Police Force after 25 years exemplary service. He's one of the most respected figures in the community and is highly regarded by everybody in the force and local people alike. He's also highly regarded amongst world ufology. He's lectured throughout Europe, the United States, places like Iceland. He's had some uncomfortable experiences with intelligence officials particularly in the United States over the years, and he may elaborate on that a little bit later. But for sure, he's embarked upon a crusade, if you like, to get at the truth. And he's done it in such a way that some of the revelations that have uh, emanated from his case study reports and investigations over the last three years alone have been nothing short of remarkable. The one thing that Tony prides himself on is sticking up for his sources. I know for a fact that some of the people who come forward with information, were their backgrounds and identities to be released, there would be severe problems, severe problems. And we are treading a thin line, ladies and gentlemen, whenever we come across people with the kind of information that they relate, that, that tells us there are some disturbing things going along. Um, but Tony would rather see his entire case file report torn up into shreds than reveal and put at risk his sources. And anybody with information to relate today, I can assure you, if they uh, relate that to Tony and they want it relating in confidence, it will be done so. Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Dodd, left the North Yorkshire Police Force and could have gone into any occupation immediately. But instead he chose this, to spend the remaining years, if you will, looking for answers to the UFO phenomenon. Already I think he's found some of those answers and I'm delighted to welcome Tony today to relate some of them with you. Please put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen, for a very brave man, Mr. Tony Dodd. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think we're getting to good evening. Um, I'd just like to start by talking a little bit about my first encounter, which Graham's just mentioned. A lot of you probably know about this, but it does bring me into my talk. Um, when, I, when I was a police officer in, uh, working in North Yorkshire in a very rural area, and um, when I, one night I was on patrol in the early hours of the morning, and I drove around a dark country lane and was suddenly uh, confronted uh, with a, a very, very beautiful and very um, strange uh, disc-shaped object, which is what we call a UFO. Um, that was the area where I was, of course that's a daylight shot of it, but that was the area I was on, the area of road uh, in the early hours of the morning. Of course it's very isolated and uh, at night there's no incidental street lighting or anything of that nature. And um, 
that was the object which I saw, which I came within 100 feet of. I, I had another police officer in the car with me at the time, and of course we stopped the car, got out of the car and stood there open-mouthed looking at this thing. And it, it, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. It, it, there was something about it. It, it, it couldn't possibly be something that we'd got. It's, uh, I'd been in the RAF before I joined the police, and I knew aircraft um, uh, most times. But this thing was no aircraft that we'd got. It's, it was totally soundless, uh, apart from anything else. And the whole structure of the object w it was glowing uh, with a bright white color. And I don't know what it is, but the, it, it actually, there was no fear involved you know, a lot of people have said to me, well, were you afraid? But there was no fear involved. It was, it was, if, if anything, it was exactly the opposite. It had a, a quite remarkable effect on us. And, um, and a lasting effect, I might add. Because after that, um, I used to spend time on these moors in the hope that uh, I might just on the off chance see another one. And when I was off duty, I used to go on to the moors many a time with other people. And over a period of years, we saw many of these things. And uh, it, it, there seemed to be an attachment growing between us and them. There was never any hostility or anything like that. That, that never entered the equation. Um, <clears throat> but it was to our knowledge that other people had reported these things previously to, to us seeing these. And therefore, it, um, in our mind, we thought, well, if other people have seen them around this area, we've seen them around this area, perhaps they frequent this area uh, on a, a regular basis. And then one night after, uh, it would probably be about 18 months to two years after this, I was sitting on the top of the moors and I had three colleagues with me when um, an object came across the top of our car. It wasn't uh, this shape this time, it was triangular. And it had um, a variety of lights on the underside of this thing. And as it passed over the top of the car, I flashed, started to flash lights at it. I thought, well, you never know, you may just get a response on one of these occasions. And uh, we, we were absolutely dumbfounded because this thing suddenly turned and came back to us. And it actually hovered in front of us and it, it was about 75 feet above the ground. And uh, it had a long elliptical light on the front of it. The light was probably about oh, 18 inches wide at its widest and it tapered off at the edges to nothing. And it, the, it was probably about 15 feet long, the light. And I'm standing there looking at this thing um, with my two colleagues and this light started to pulse, getting brighter and dimmer, brighter and dimmer, almost as if it was signaling. And then suddenly the thing turned and banked away and then it shot away like you'd never believe. And um, I was quite, you know, dumbfounded by this, the fact we actually got, we've got reaction from this thing. And when I went to speak to my two colleagues, they'd gone and they were about 100 yards down the road. And I hadn't realized I'd been stood there on my own. But uh, so that was just another one of these uh, incidents what, uh, where we had these type of encounters. But that brought in other things into the equation because it was very, very bizarre, really, because things started to develop as a result of having these, seeing these things. And one of the things which happened to me was, and I can only associate it with the connection with these, and it was that I seemed to develop the ability to see events before they occurred. And, and Pete, there are people in this audience who this will make sense because it's happened to quite a lot of people. But it was something that it had never happened to me prior to this. And, um, and then suddenly these things started to happen when I could see things, uh, i.e. I saw the space shuttle explode on, on its launch, which was a very, very sad thing. And unfortunately, every time I saw one of these events, it was always something where there was a tragedy involved. It was always very, uh, something not very pleasant. And of course, I didn't like it very much, but I couldn't stop myself seeing the things. I saw the um, results of the Gulf War with the oil fields on fire. I saw that weeks before the Gulf War ever came to be. And so it brought that aspect of things into the equation. And what I say, I have to be very careful what I say. I'm always told, be careful what you say. There are things which people will accept and things that people won't accept. But the problem with this UFO game, we don't know what we're dealing with. We've got something here which we accept is ET. I'm convinced it's ET. ET, craft, or whatever you like. But there's also, it also brings a spiritual element into it. And when one, one thing starts to happen, another thing starts to happen and gels in with it. And when I say I could see events before they occurred, that was just one of a series of things which happened to me 
where after a period of time I started to, don't ask me why, but I started to get these, what was, appeared to be messages. And I was writing messages down, which I was uh, going into my head. And I didn't know what I'd written until I'd written them. And some of the things that I wrote were very, very beautiful. There's no question about that. They were absolutely remarkable things. And um, so this is the kind of effect this thing was having me, on me at this time. So this is how I got into the game. Um, I, yes, I, as Graham said, I received threats. Yes, I received, uh, I was threatened when I was within the police. I had to give up what I was doing. I must not make what I was finding out public. I had to be very careful. Um, so I had to sort of take a back seat while I was in the police until I retired. And, um, and then, as time went past and I received hundreds of reports from all over the UK, as I still do from all the investigators, because we've got lots and lots of good investigators, um, you start to form pictures on these things. There, and the, one of the pictures which has certainly emerged out of this, that there is no question whatsoever that, that there is an ET element out there. It's not a case of are they out there. They're out there, all right, make no mistake about it and they are making contact with certain people, of that I have no doubt. Now, after that, I'll, I, uh, I'll go on to the part that got me in the next lot of trouble. I was in um, Las Vegas six months ago, lecturing at um, a, a very big uh, international conference there, and I was, the subject of my lecture was information I was releasing about a confrontation between UFOs and our warships up in the Arctic Ocean. Now I'd got some very, very good contacts, and as Graham says, of course, these can't be named for obvious reasons, but I had contacts who were informing me that there was under, uh, very large underwater craft had been uh, operating up from the Arctic Circle on the coast of Iceland, down past Norway, down to the coast of England, and that uh, several warships had been sent to the area, including NATO warships, uh, American warships, and, uh, and also submarines. I was also told that what had happened was radar, the advance rate warning radar, had picked up objects coming down and actually landing in the sea, up off the Arctic Circle once again. Now then, the next thing that happened, these things were seen to come down and enter the sea. The next thing that happened, the um, Icelandic fishermen, um, obviously Iceland, uh, the whole of its economy is based on its fishing industry, and so they've got many fishing boats, um, reported seeing these huge underwater objects moving at fast speeds uh, close to their boats and in fact certain instances these things actually tangled with the nets of the uh, fishing boats and tore them to shreds. There was a confrontation of some sort going up, on up there between our warships and whatever it was under the water and this is what I was lecturing about in Las Vegas and I, um, when I got down from my lecture I was pulled to one side by certain people and Wendell who spoke previously knows all about this because he was at the same conference and I was wa warned in no uncertain terms that um, if I carried on the way I was I was going to be killed <coughs> excuse me they, they also got me a wife and threatened me wife and they said I was a very dangerous person I was releasing top secret information which wasn't for the public knowledge and um, they would stop me mate. they said I was told make no mistake they were going to stop me uh, they said it wasn't a case of don't do it again, it was a case you've gone too far already so you were a marked man, that's what they said. And um, their parting shot with me was watch your car when you're driving in future. Now the significance of that was that when I'd been on the stage I had been telling them about an incident where somebody who had uh, been releasing information 12 months earlier in, uh, in Germany had been killed in a road accident and he had been releasing information similar to what I'd been talking about. Now, when this chap was killed in the road accident in Germany, um, the German police said that he'd been drinking heavily, etc., etc., which led to the accident, uh, which was a load of rubbish because this man had been teetotal all his life. So that's when the significance of watch your car when you're driving it in future came into the equation. So, what I do is I tell everybody about it. So if everything, anything happens to me, you all know why. And that is, that's my safeguard, my protection. I was in America two years ago, and I was talking in Tucson and Arizona at the World in, uh, UFO Congress there, and I was talking about an incident which all certainly investigators will know about, but uh, 
perhaps other people don't, where the uh, UFO crashed in South Africa and the, the, the UFO was recovered plus live aliens. And I was lecturing in Tucson, Arizona about that. And on that occasion, when I came down off the stage, I was also taken to one side. That was a couple of years earlier. But this time it was by the CIA. And they, they weren't quite as belligerent towards me. They certainly threatened me and said, look, we have means of stopping you. If you carry on the way you are, we're going to stop you one way or the other. Make no mistake about it. You, you're causing upset you are. You're rocking the boat, if you like. And we have means to stop you. And I said to them at the time, I said, no, you've got means to stop me. I said, but if you, you've got the means, stop me. Because I'm not going to stop unless they stop me. And that might seem a bit silly, a silly thing to say, but I've been in this thing now for 20 years. I've certainly been at it full time since I finished in the police. There are things out there which are occurring which the public has a right to know about. It affects the public. It is our future. And I think the public have a right to know about it. And I will do my damnedest to get to the bottom of this. And I will release it when I get it. And I don't care who it upsets. I'm talking about UFOs. I'm not talking about state secrets in relation to military. If there's anybody here listening as there usually is, I'm not interested in military secrets. I'm interested in UFOs and what is associated with them. So when you go back, please tell your hierarchy that is the case. So anyway, what I want to go on with this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, is I want to talk about two particular things. One I want to talk about is abductions. And once again, of course, the investigators will be well versed with these. And then I will go on to another thing which is likely to get me in trouble in the near future, and that is the animal mutilations. But if we start with the abductions, and I've dealt with God knows how many dozens of people now who have suffered the abduction syndrome. It's happening all over the world. I'm in touch with most countries in the world. It's happening in virtually every country that we know, certainly all the major countries. It's now in the open that this is, that this is a phenomenon that is here to stay. And it's, uh, so various investigators throughout the world, John Mack in America, Bud Hopkins in America, are friends of mine, uh, all people in different parts of the country are dealing with this thing. And of course you know the thing is raging at this moment in time. It is, is an abduction a real experience? Is it something psychological or what? Well, all the ones I've dealt with, and I've dealt with a great many of these, and we've had most of them under regressive hypnosis, point to the fact that this is a real physical event. That these abductions really are something which is happening to people. There are a, a multitude of cases, and I think the best thing I can do, I'll show you first of all a clip from a video which I took of one of my abductees while they were under hypnosis, hypnosis. and for those who've never seen anything like this, it's, you might find it quite interesting. Could I have the first video clip please? This shows you the trauma that somebody can uh, go through under the hypnosis. Their faces just seem so mean. They're just Okay, that's fine. And how many of them are there? I'm, I'm sure there's three or four. There's seen three round this side and, and, and one here. Okay. Okay, so now tell us what they're she's doing. She's describing being on a and table in a craft. Now, this is what she's talking about. And remember, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's one of them looking at the ears. One of them doing something with my hair somewhere. And one of them's probing about somewhere in the back of my teeth. And they seem to be talking. I said, oh, I can't understand. But they they they're working and they seem to be connecting or something with each other and and saying what is the next thing that they're going to do. They don't talk to me. and They just seem to be looking at everywhere. They're lifting up my breasts now and they just seem to be going all the way through. Have you, have you any clothes on at this time? No. Uh -huh. When you say they communicate with each other, is this by some audible communication? Yeah. There is a sound coming yeah, from Yeah, I can hear. I can yeah. definitely hear. Okay, that's fine. Go on and describe what they're doing. Are they using instruments or is, are they... Uh, from some part of me they've extracted something because it, it, it they've got something that looks like um, when we have a 
an extraction, a token. One of them's got something, I don't know what he's got. Um, Where has he got this from, do you know? I don't know. I don't know. Uh -huh. I've seen some blood now. There is some blood on a, a tool of some sort, but I, I, I just don't seem to be able to see where it's coming from. Can you describe the tool? What does it look like? One's got a probe now. And I know, I, I understand this time what they're saying, and there seems to be great excitement in, in the fact that I've had a hysterectomy. Goodness only knows why. And that they all coming together now, and, and oh, that they're, they're so so interested in, in in what has happened there, and the whys and the wherefores, and and these three seem to have spoken to this one, and and it's up to this one to get the probe, and I see this probe. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes, they're not going to hurt you. Next thing is that this probe goes in my navel, <laughs> and it hurts so much. Yes. 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 And I'm screaming, I'm begging for God's sake, you're causing me so much pain. <laughs> uh huh. Yes. Yes. And, and at this point, I, I beg them, but they don't stop. They just carry on. It's just as if they've got a job to do, and it's as if they don't hear what they don't want to hear, but they carry on. While this is going on, somebody's doing something with a toenail, taking scraping or something with a toenail. Stop it, please. That was just to give you an example of the, the trauma that these uh, abductees can go through. The type of um, thing that they've um, told, told you in the books, of the, the things that are being done to them, virtually carbon copying in, in virtually every uh, abduction case you get. Uh, I was comparing notes with John Mack about this, and he agreed that the uh, signs and everything else were exactly the same in this country as in the United States. Now, we feel that we are we're touching the tip of the iceberg with this. We're, we're only getting a very, very small proportion of the people that this has happened to, because a great many people, of course, they don't know it's happened to them. And uh, the interesting thing, if we start looking at uh, percentages and things, John Mack tells me that he's getting 50% male to 50% female in America, whereas in this country we're getting about 80% female and 20% male. And uh, we, we sort of discuss this from a psychological point of view. And I think the, the conclusion we came to was not that there was, it was happening to less males than females in this country, but that the males are a bit uh, more reluctant to come forward with these things. And we think that's where we've got this sort of imbalance in uh, one to the other. So that was one case I, I, uh, of abduction I dealt with. And that was typical in as much as that uh, woman, when, it, when we actually got to the, uh, the stage of finding out, I mean, that particular incident was not the first abduction. That was the first one we put her under hypnosis, but what happens in all cases of abduction is it starts as a child and it's a repeated process. Usually starts at four, five or six years of age and it will go on uh, repeatedly over years up to puberty and beyond. And that is in every case I've ever dealt with. And it's an ongoing monitoring situation. It's almost as if they're adjusting that individual for some particular thing at a later date. And it's, it, they monitor them all their life and whether they, uh, by virtue of what they're doing to them, they're just uh, to whatever it is their intentions are. Now, interestingly, um, that's nothing to do with what we're talking about. You, you will find that my slides never meet what I'm talking about, so don't worry about it, and we'll, we'll get there. Um, interestingly, on a couple of occasions when we, I've had abductees under hypnosis, I've actually ended up apparently speaking to somebody else through the abductee, and the who it is I'm supposed to be talking to is supposed to be the aliens. Now, I know this is bizarre. The whole thing is bizarre. The whole subject's bizarre. Now, when I ask the voice talking to me through the abductee, well, how, how is it possible for you to talk to me at this moment in time when the last time when this person was abducted was three or four weeks ago? The answer com came back is that you have no perception of what is, what is, what is real. There is no such thing as time. 
Time is a thing which you have created to give yourself an orderly society, which of course is necessary. But in the, in the scale of things, there is no such thing as time. And therefore, when that we come and speak to you, it just doesn't matter. We're not coming back from yesterday or tomorrow. And that, it is the now, which was very, very interesting. And I asked a great many questions, and I got some very, very interesting answers. And in, the reason I'm focusing on this particular point of it is because some of the answers I was getting were way, were way beyond the intellect of the person I was talking to, the, 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 the uh, woman under hypnosis. And one of the things I said, I said, well, are you the, what we call gods? And they said, that is the way some of you perceive us. And I said, well, if that is the case, do you require us to worship you? And they said, no, this is not necessary. Um, I kept asking, uh, I asked a whole battery of questions during these sequences, but they kept coming back to me and saying, you do not understand the nature of things. You, you, it's as if, and, and the way this voice was coming across, it was almost not, not so much with contempt, but it was certainly talking down to me. There's no question about that. And uh, another thing, I said, well, what gives you the right to take a person against their will without their knowledge and take them, abduct them and do what you're doing to them? And the answer came back in very, very quick time, well, isn't this what you do to your lower animals? So <laughs> what way do they perceive as these? Are we, as we look down at a guinea pig or one of our, you know, our pets, I mean, we're all pet level, let's be right about that. But nevertheless, they are pets. And do these people up there look at us the same way? If we talk about intellectual difference, are they so far on advanced on us they look down on us as we, would, as we would look on a guinea pig and therefore treat us accordingly? Because that's the way it came across in this, um, this interview. Now, interview, well, whatever you want to call it. I asked them if there were bad aliens as well as good ones and they said, yes, there were. And the bad ones were dangerous. And I, I asked them, well, how do I know a dangerous one? They said, you wouldn't know a dangerous one because they are also flying these things around. Uh, the same as we are. And, uh, but it says, if you meet these, if you come across these, you will be in danger. So that was another thing that came, uh, came through in these sessions. And um, so it went on and on, and you, get, you tend to get a better perception of what's happening here. And the fact that they were actually, well, whatever it is I was speaking to, was prepared to answer questions for me. But it was still... It came across as we didn't have the right to know what was going on around us. We could not perceive, we haven't the intelligence, or whatever you want to call it, that we couldn't take what is the truth, if we knew it. So that was one part of the... Uh, oh, I'm just going to... I know I'm going to digress because that slides on. That is when I was talking about being threatened. That was a German newspaper. I was lecturing in Germany. And then suddenly this thing appeared in this front pages of a German newspaper saying that I was in with the CIA, I was MI6 or 5 or something or other, and I, was, I had been taken down into the underground um, facilities in America, I had been shown the aliens and I had been shown the down craft and oh, a, a whole load of rubbish. And uh, when I found out about this on this newspaper, I contacted them in Germany and you know, I said, well, where the hell have you got this sort of rubbish from to, uh, to put my name in this paper like this? And they said that the, um, some correspondent in Vienna had contacted them and given this story. And I said, well, I'm going to sue you because it's absolute lies. And uh, th th there was all sorts of strange things happening. By the time I got a German solicitor onto them, and uh, by the time he got to them, apparently it was dated. You can know, you've got to, in, in Germany, if you want to take legal action against somebody, it's got to be done within a very tight time frame. And when I, my solicitor got onto them, it was outside the time frame, so I couldn't take any action. Uh, but I've never, I've never seen such a pack of lies as that in my life. I mean, one minute I'm supposed to be one of them, and the next minute I'm being threatened with my life. You know, it's, it's just a matter of interest. Okay, one or two alien pictures. Now, these mainly are the types of aliens which people are uh, describing in, um, certainly under uh, hypnosis in the abduction cases, and certainly people who have actually had uh, confrontations with down, UFOs down on the ground. And there, there is a variation in them, but, and, and the, you know, these are the slight variations you get in them. Now, there is, there's a lot about being said about this reptile type of uh, alien. And now, if, what they call Bob Lazar, reckons that they have actually got those in the underground facilities at Area 51. 
that they are liaising, as well as the greys, they are liaising with the American authorities, but they are basically a lizard type. Very, very powerful, very, very strong. And uh, they, it, from what I can understand is they, they will not bother you unless you make them angry, but if you make them angry, get out of the way, because they, they're very, this is what I'm told, they're savage. Now that is the one which a lot of you have seen from the, uh, the book. It was um, an American, a Canadian professor actually put this um, little fella together and he said this is what the um, dinosaurs would look like today if they'd stayed on earth and had evolved. That's exactly what they would look like and they would just have two arms and two legs the same as us. So there is actually a theory that there may be in some underground, uh, not uh, the, the facilities, but in some underground caves or whatever you like to think, where the dinosaurs suddenly started to disappear off the face of the earth, some of them may have got underground and evolved to today's, what we would see today as an intelligent type of being. That is this professor's theory. And uh, that's, uh, that's what, as I say, that's what he said it would look like. Now that particular picture, once, one, uh, certainly the researchers amongst you will have seen it. I was given this photograph by Marina Popovich, the um, Russian astronaut. We're quite, quite friendly. And when I was in Germany, she was talking about how she attended a convention in Canada, a convention of scientists, because she, apart from that, uh, most of your astronauts are scientists in one degree or another anyway. And she went to this convention and she was actually given this photograph by one of the top scientists there who was actually, I've forgotten his name just off the um, top of my head, but he's dead now anyway. And she said he told her that this was a photograph of one of the aliens that had uh, been recovered. We don't know the truth of it. I can only tell you what she told me. Now, interestingly enough, on that particular visit to Germany, uh, there was a Russian contingent there. There were about four or five of them, and they seemed nice enough people. And uh, I got friendly with them because we were exchanging information and... Um, we were sort of, you know, I was telling them my UFO, UFO stuff, they were telling us theirs. And in the hotel bedroom, they actually invited my wife and me to go to their bedroom and have a drink with them. And this seemed to go down badly in some quarters. There were some American uh, operatives there. And uh, next thing I know is we went, my wife and me went to our bedroom to get changed, to go in the Russian's room. And while we're in the bedroom, a letter comes under the door. Be very, very careful what you tell the Russians. Don't tell them anything. They'll try to get you drunk and find out what you know. Uh, signed a friend. <laughs> so, uh, it, you know, it was spies amongst spies. It, it, it was quite remarkable, really. It, uh, but anyway, that's what Marina Popovich says that was. These are one or two of the other um, artist impressions of these things. And they're basically all the same type of thing with the, the, big, black, uh, the big black eyes. Now, the interesting thing is, I was talking to my American counterparts who are dealing with the um, abduction uh, syndrome only the other day, and there's been a new twist of events on this abduction thing. What the American researchers and hypnotists have decided to do, they, because we've always, we were getting all these cases of abduction, but we'd never got anything physically could get hold of as proof, apart from many people with many scars and things like this, they were implanting into the abductee's mind that the next time that they were abducted, get hold of something and bring it back with you. If you can't do that, attack the greys who are much uh, inferior to us physically. And if you can scratch them or something, you can get some of their skin under your fingernails. Something we could get for analysis, in other words. Well, one of the abductees they did this to, in very, very quick time after this incident, had an abduction experience. Now she never got a chance to get her hands on anything because when they had her on the table and that she couldn't move or anything else but at one stage she was free and she attacked one of these greys but this was in her bedroom and she hit it in the eye apparently and knocked one of the big black eyes apparently out. Now what happened was the grey immediately disappeared but it, uh, oh let me get you right once she knocked this it was like an eye shield it wasn't an eye as such, it was almost like her sunglass. She knocked this thing off which fell to the floor of the bedroom and there were flashing red, little flashing red lights inside. But the thing about it is of course they recovered the thing that she'd knocked out of the alien's eye. And it was described to me as being a very thin type of 
uh, membrane type of material, but it was exactly like a coloured sunglass. Anyway, they're looking at that at this moment in time. But the point of all this is, it has proved now, almost beyond a shadow of a doubt, that these greys are actually biological androids and that they are working for a higher figure. Okay. So now, that brings into it, when we have people under hypnosis, they're not just describing the greys. We're getting people, as a lot of researchers here well know, we're getting the tall blondes, the Nordic type, as we call them, the long blonde hair, beautiful blue eyes, look just like you and me, yet a lot more beautiful, a lot better looking, if you like. About six foot tall, uh, beautiful people. Every time you get this described under hypnosis, these are beautiful. Now, every time you get a person in pain under hypnosis, like the previous thing you saw, this tall blonde one usually comes forward and holds his hand above their body, and the pain disappears immediately, and they get a feeling of well-being. So, obviously, they don't want us to feel pain by whatever it is they're doing. Um, these blondes, they do seem to have some sort of, they, they care. They care whether they're hurting us. They care at the distress that the individual is is going through but it's almost it's almost as if the whole process is necessary it's something that has got to be done and it's from my point of view I am convinced that they are in control of us and that they are directing our evolution because the indications are that they've been coming here and doing this to people for an awful lot of years not 10 years not 20 years hundreds of years and um, it, it, everything points that there, there is a manipulation going on and they are actually manipulating uh, the way we evolve, the direction they want us to go in. And I'm convinced in my own mind that this is the case. People might argue with me, but that is my theory from all the experience I've had with this. That particular case you've got on the screen at the moment is another case, an abduction case I uh, dealt with not so long ago, of a mother and daughter. They were... Work, they worked at a factory in Birmingham and at about six o'clock in the morning they set off to work as which that was their normal routine every morning at six o'clock uh, the mother picked the daughter up who lived next door but one I think it was and then they walked to work together this particular morning the same thing occurs and uh, they're making their normal way to work and one of the, um, the it's only ten minutes to work incidentally from where they live they turned down and walked down a fairly narrow alley now that is the alley which is shown on that picture. As they walk, it's, it's very, very quiet this time on, as you'll appreciate, there's not, not much about it at all. They're walking down this alley, and suddenly they, they hear this strange noise, and it's a, the only way they could describe it was like a whirring noise, a strange whirring noise, which seemed to be coming from above. And the next thing they describe is a light in front of them, as if somebody's above them, shining a torch down on, on them, and it's blinding them. And that's where they seem to lose all sen sen sense of reality. And the next thing is that they are actually floating up into the air. They said they physically float up, and they're looking down, and they can see the houses below them. Now, they ended up inside this, what we assume is a craft. They're both on a table, both laid down, both can't move, both naked. Now, what I did with the, the hypnosis side of this, obviously, I wouldn't allow one person in the building while I was uh, doing the hypnosis on the other. We didn't want any contamination from one to the other. And then we you know, did the hypnosis on both. And the stories they both told were absolutely identical. They'd both been in this craft, they'd both been on a table, they both had a certain amount of little grey fellas around them, and they were both being subject to this uh, type of procedure that the, uh, the grey types uh, subject people to. And um, the young, the girl, uh, the mother, it was mother and daughter, as I say, the girl had just got a, a beautiful leather coat and it cost about 140 pounds. She was so proud of this coat. And she's under hypnosis, it's interesting because she's more interested in where this coat's gone. And uh, anyway, the coat's been taken from her and it's hanging up. So they are subjected to the various types of um, probing as they do where they add um, uh, things put in their, in their navel, which is the, the normal one. There's always the, the navel part always comes into. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail over this, but the thing is, both of them had a tube inserted into their navel. Navel, and uh, I'll give you. The, I'm just going to show you an excerpt from this where the mother of the two is under hypnosis, where she talks about them removing eggs from her. And um, 
But the girl, the daughter, was exactly the same thing. Same, she, in fact, under hypnosis, she was worried. And she's laying on the table and saying, I hope they don't hurt my mother. I hope they don't hurt her. And she was more distressed for her mother, which was, it was quite you know, remarkable to hear this. And they were looking in their eyes, they were, their hair, etc., etc. And, uh, but both, after this incident, both had a, a problem with their stomach, with the navel, around the navel area, as many abductees you will find if you ever get in this field do. I have found about 90% of female abductees I've dealt with have a, tr have a trouble with the navel. And this is as a result of this instrument being put through. Now, I don't know whether we've got any uh, doctors, medical doctors here, but I have spoke to a couple over this and said, you know, well, what kind of normal... You're trying to eliminate things to try to find, is this something that's normal, you know? And I was told it is not normal. The only time that you are likely to get this problem with a woman where she has trouble from a navel, where there's a discharge, is when the, our own medical profession uses a, some sort of technique. I don't, there's a special name, somebody will no doubt be able to tell me, where, they, where they're um, fertilizing uh, women through the, the, the navel. They put a tube in through the navel. There's a special word for it anyway. And the only time you get this trouble is if there's an infection sets in as a result of that intrusion. Now, none of my abductees have ever been subject to that by the medical profession. They've never had anything like this done yet. As I say, eight or even possibly nine out of ten have this problem with their navel as a result of this uh, instruments being put there. Now, at one stage under the hypnosis, the young girl says one of the aliens has got this leather jacket. And she's quite disturbed about this. What's, what's he doing with my leather jacket, you see? <laughs> and um, it was actually rubbing it on its face, as if to feel the texture of the, the coat and that. And when they eventually, uh, they suddenly, uh, after a while, they suddenly lost all consciousness, and they ended up back walking down this little alley at the, various, ver this the very same point where they've been taken. And this girl's coat is on her, but it's wet through, absolutely wet through. Yet there'd been no rain. It was, totally, it was totally dry where they were. And so that was something. She said, well, my coat's wet. Where's, all the, where's the water come from on my coat? You know, another sign and another symptom of this thing. But both of them, when they got to work, which and they arrived at work very late, as you can imagine, all, one side of their face was totally sunburned, which once again is, fits in with the criteria of what we get with abductions. I'm just going to put the next video clip on about this. I'm not... She's quite spoken as this lady, so you might not hear too much. If you could put it on, please. Oh, now. Yes, and I know what they say do, so nothing to know what they do. Nothing to know when to move. Why, why are they putting the tube into your name? Because they've got to do a test. What kind of test? Absolute. To see if any baby's there. Mm -hmm. And what is their interest in if there's any baby there? To see if I can sell baby. And why are they interested in that? Because they've the before. Because of other babies before, mm. what babies are we talking about? When they've done it before, they've, they've done it before for babies to see if there's any babies there, so they can so they know how to do the babies. Mm. Huh? I think it's for eggs, to see if any eggs are there. Uh -huh. Looking for action. I think so. Because if there's a baby there, they wouldn't do it. Things uh -huh. don't look right. Stop, please. So that was just another one. I don't know whether you could hear it very well, but that was the that was the mother of the two that were uh, were abducted, and. Um, they, that, they, it was a continuous process. That's another one. That's another girl that was abducted. Uh, uh, another one I dealt with. Now that is an interesting one because it, her abduction uh, happened in America when she was a schoolgirl, and her father was an American Air Force. Um, he, well, I don't know what he was, a pilot or what, but he worked on an American Air Force base, and they lived just outside the base. 
and she'd been to visit some friends one night. Apparently she was a, she was a member of a very, very strict family. And uh, she went to visit some friends a couple of houses down from hers one night. Uh, one day, I beg your pardon. And um, leaves the house to come back home during daylight. And suddenly, it's, as she's walking along between the houses on the road, this thing comes down over her, over her head and hovers in the air above her. And the next thing, of course, bank is gone. As she then reappears walking along the road about two hours later, gets in an awful lot of trouble when she arrives back home from her parents for being late home. But the only thing was, there was one of the neighbours happened to look out the window and actually saw this thing take her up into it. And um, she, once again, goes through all the same trauma as, the, as any of the normal abductees go through. And um, they're carbon copy. There's no question about that. These abductions are carbon copy. Now, if we go on just a, a, a stage further on this abduction thing, is we talk about implants, because what happens is, of course, they tag. People who are being abducted are tagged. They have an implant put in their body whereby the, um, our abductors know where to find them whenever they want them. Now, they have recovered some of these tags in America particularly. We haven't got the facilities available in this country, unfortunately, because the only way that you can um, see these implants in people is either by the use uh, of a CAT scanner or a resonance image scanner. Now, if you want to get the use of a CAT scanner in this country, it's virtually impossible unless you're dying. Um, I've spoke to the medical people and that they said it costs £6,000 a time to put somebody under one of those. And if there's a waiting list as long as you're arm in most places to go on them. So for us to say, well, do you think you can have a look see if there's an implant in this person? Forget it. The Yanks, I shall be pardon, the Americans. Uh, <laughs> The Americans have got far more facilities than we have and they've got easy access to these kind of machines and consequently they have been having a um, great deal of success in locating these implants in people's heads. I am told that they've actually recovered two or three of these from uh, people's heads and that they uh, are subject to scientific analysis and they say that they are some type of transmitter but they're on such a small scale that they're way beyond our technology. Now that particular one, that is a... Um, a microscope photograph of an implant which was taken out of a chap in America. It doesn't mean a lot to us, I mean under a microscope everything looks strange, but uh, that is a, a, a photograph of an implant from one of these people in America. Now that is a report from a university who analyzed the um, implant and I'm just trying to see it, it's moving up and down. <laughs> it, just, it says not for attrition or distribution. In other words, they didn't want anybody outside the university or whatever to know that they'd put this report out. And they refer to it as an alleged alien implant there, but they said that this thing is made of substances which, uh, it's, it, it basically, it was a small uh, capsule, if you like, a minute capsule, but it had hooks on it. And when it was put into the body, the hooks grab onto the flesh to stop this thing coming out, to, to retain it. And they said they'd never seen the like of it in their life before and it was, it was most bizarre. So that was that. Well, of course, uh, once again, I keep referring to the researchers because I know there's a lot of them here and they'll all be aware of this case. I'm, I'm speaking basically for the people who are not uh, conversant with this UFO game. Bud Hopkins, of course, who is the well-known American uh, authority on uh, abductions, and Linda Cartel. Now, on this particular incident, this woman was supposed to have been seen being actually seen being abducted. Perez de Cuela, who was the Secretary General of the United Nations at the time, was in a, a car, an official car in America, being escorted to a helipad. He'd been to some function and he was being taken uh, under armed guard to the helipad to get a helicopter from out of the place to some other place. And they think that this particular episode took place for him to see. They wanted him to see it. So they're driving this car down the road, and suddenly the electronics on the car cut out. Now, in the close distance, there's several, several tower blocks, uh, well, up to 10 stories high, residential blocks. And, as I say, immediately the electrics cut out in the car. The armed guards jumped out the car thinking it was a setup or something, and they're there with the guns for anybody who wants to get at Paris de Quayle. But 
suddenly their attention was attracted by this object hovering in the air outside one of these blocks of flats. And they're watching as a beam of light coming down from it and focusing on one of the windows. And while they watch this thing, they see what appear to be our little grey fellas sliding down this blue light in through the window of this building and then a few seconds later out of the light out through the window up the light this time they've got a woman with them and she's apparently she's curled up in the fetal position they recorded all this did these um, security guards and everything else they were absolutely stunned by it as you can imagine watching this thing of course when the woman had disappeared into the object whew, away the object went now Later, these two security guards contacted Bud Hopkins over this and said, hey, you ain't going to believe what we've seen. And they gave him the information on it. And as a result of it, Bud Hopkins went to see this woman and had a conversation with her, uh, regardless of the incident that the uh, security guards had witnessed. But he had a conversation with her, and it turned out she was, an, she was an abductee, and she was being abducted regular away. And it turned out at a later date that the, well, she says that the um, CIA tried to kill her, they tried to drown her. She was on a beach, uh, apparently uh, uh, some form of lonely beach uh, one afternoon, and two CIA operatives came and they dragged her into the water and tried to hold her down under the water. Uh, but um, somebody came along in the distance and they let go and disappeared, and she, you know, she wasn't drowned, she was only half drowned. But that's the story she told. I don't know, stranger things happen. These are the CAT scan type pictures you get uh, taken of um, if you get somebody, you know, if you have taken of somebody's skull, and these are the, the type of pictures which will show the implants. Now that's that's one in more detail, and I don't know whether you can see them, but there is an arrow pointing to where there is an implant there in that section of the skull. I know it's, it looks a bit gruesome to look at, but that is where there's an implant in the skull, which has been located by CAT scanning. So that is that one. Yeah, premature. <coughs> So basically, ladies and gentlemen, this is what uh, is going on as far as the abduction um, syndrome. I've got uh, so many people waiting to go under hypnosis, it's something where you just can't keep up with it and you have to take it one at a time. Um, I had one only this uh, last week from a woman in the New Forest. And she, uh, she doesn't know she's been abducted. She was just telling me of an incident which had occurred which was so bizarre she couldn't equate with it. Uh, but there's no question about it from what she's telling me this woman is subject to abduction and that when the truth of it comes out it will be an abduction okay I'm now going to change to something totally different and I hope this I tell you about I get involved in things that get me into trouble well this one's likely to get me into trouble as well I'm going to talk about animal mutilations as you're probably aware and most of you be probably aware um, animal mutilations have been taking place on a large scale in the United States since the early 1960s. Um, when I say a large scale, I mean a large scale. In a two-year period, they had 10,000 cattle killed and mutilated, and the mutilations were virtually identical in every case. Organs removed from the body, internal organs removed from the body, in every case a blood loss, total blood loss in the body. 1,000-pound bulls were being found there, dead on the ground, no signs of a struggle, no footprints around it. How's this being done? Nobody ever saw anything happen. Now, in America, you can imagine some of these uh, prize bulls, a thousand pound bulls, were worth a great deal of money. And the farming community in America were getting upset, make no mistake about this. Uh, they, were up there, they were getting on to every uh, authority out there to get something done about this, catch the perpetrators of this thing, you know, and stop them losing money. So the FBI were brought into it, and they formed an investigative body um, uh, on the instructions of the government to get into this thing and find out what was causing these animal mutilations. And when I say animal mutilations, it wasn't just cows and bulls. I mentioned them because that was the, the, the vast majority of animals which were being killed were cows and bulls. But it was going right across the spectrum. They were getting cows, bulls, goat, sheep, wild animals, deer, Elks, you name it, the type of animals they have in the States, they were finding them dead and mutilated. And, as I say, always in similar circumstances. Rectum cord out, always a blood loss, various uh, organs missing, a tongue missing. If it was a cow, the udder would be missing. And the thing about it was, when they were having these animals analysed, the wounds analysed on these animals, they were finding that the organs had been removed by a very, very strange method. They hadn't been removed with a normal knife to cut away anything like that. 
they'd, they'd been removed with an instrument which could only have been a laser type instrument because what was happening is it was burning as it cut it burnt and it was actually the hemoglobin in the area where the cutting had taken place had, had cooked as a result of the use of the instrument so as I say they got the FBI going onto this and there's no question it's all the CIA were involved and there were big meetings taking place in America about this now what you might think well what the hell is this to do with UFOs well, the thing was that the only common denominator with this thing is that farmers were reporting seeing these glowing balls of light hovering over the fields. And this was happening regularly. So we then start thinking, this is the UFO element of this thing. That all the police forces were mobilized. As I say, there were uh, very, very big meetings in America where they, as I say, they got all these major bodies to get the answer, find the answer to this thing. Now, this uh, was going on from 61 onwards. To this day, nobody has come up with the culprit. Yet, these things are still taking place. Now, surely to God, if something is taking place to the magnitude this is, somebody must see something somewhere. Yet, nobody sees anything. All they do is find the result of it. Now, this is the American side I'm talking about, and the Canadian side, and of course there are many other countries. I'm going to get to the English side, which I've been focusing on lately. Because it's been happening in England, make no mistake about that. And it's been happening more than the average general member of the public knows. Um, it, I, don't, I don't want to start to say anything here that's likely to upset anybody or frighten. That is not the intention. All I'm saying is we've got a phenomenon here which is happening. And um, we want to find the answer to it. What the hell is, what's doing this thing? So I'm going to give you a clip first of all from a Linda Howe a latest tape in America. Because Linda Howe is as known as the world authority on this. Because she's had so many cases in America she's dealt with. And I'm just going to give you a clip uh, of a, a videotape which where they're talking about the balls of light. Where this is over an area where they've been getting the mutilations. Can I have the video, please? The relationship between the UFOs that people are seeing up here and what's happening to these cattle or not. Uh, we've got the same thing happening up here. We've got people reporting UFOs and we've got people reporting mutilated cattle, and we've got people reporting helicopters. That same night, around 7 to 9 p.m., a few miles to the west in Cedar Bluff, Alabama, a family who lives in a remote wooded area videotaped several unusual moving objects above a lake near their home. It's moving. It moved away. Pat Beard and her son James watched and videotaped for nearly two hours. It's leaving, you no. At one point, the large white object disappeared, and the dark sky filled with mysterious flashes of light. God. It's just jumping everywhere. I'm getting it good now, James. Then the large white light returned. Almost immediately, two other objects appeared to the left, and the bottom light seemed to dim and brighten several times. A fourth object suddenly moved between the other three. As it passed below the bright white light, the camera panned, and there were two more objects. Then the big white light moved toward them. And what I actually thought it looked like. Okay, that's enough, thanks. So that was the, one of the incidents where you get these things, strange things flying over the fields where these animal mutilations are occurring. As I say, they had police departments, the American sheriff's offices, and the whole um, shebang of them were involved. Now then, I'm going to start from the English side now. We have been aware that there's been sporadic incidents across the country where people have been... Um, found mutilated, dead and mutilated animals. I know for a fact that they've had some in Wales uh, where some mutilated sheep were involved. But if I can take this in some form of chronological order. When I, I was, I've been watching this at a distance for a while. I couldn't understand how you could get a syndrome like they've got in the States where all these ha animals, were get, thousands and thousands of animals were getting killed, strange balls of light in the sky, yet nobody can ever find out who's done it. So I was watching that from a distance. But when it started to affect us, uh, to any degree, I started to focus on this. And 
first of all, we started getting dead seals found on the beaches up off the um, Orkney Islands. They were found in, finding large numbers of seals on the beaches, there minus their heads. And on one occasion, on one part, they found 40 dead seals on one beach with their heads removed. Now, I spoke to the vets who had a look at these bodies, did the autopsies, if you like, and they said that it was, they were totally baffled. They said they'd never seen anything like it in their life. They said because every head that had been removed from head, every seal, it had been removed uh, through the same vertebra, cut between the same vertebra on every uh, seal. And it had been so precise the way it had been done that not one bone of any seal's vertebra had been damaged. And that totally threw these vets. Now, I spoke to the local police, I spoke to the uh, Seal Protection Society up there, and there was one sly argument. Nobody knew whether these seals had died on the beach or had died in the sea and been washed up on the beach. The thing was that there was no blood in any of them, which is typical of the animal mutilation, never any blood. But they could not, nobody could come up with a firm answer and say these things had either been killed at sea or whether they'd been killed on the beaches, but uh, they were, these things were appearing for a large period of time. Okay, so that was the start of it with the seals. The next thing that happens is, one of the villages, um, I don't know if I've got the name, because some of these villages are a bit, uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, it's one of the Scottish islands, uh, one of the Scottish um, islands, excuse me, let's see if I can, no. They started finding dead sheep in, it was a fairly remote area, a small village in Scotland, and um, they started finding dead sheep in the fields with holes drilled in their head. Now, the, the, the newspapers carried a headline up in Scotland. It says, a killer beast is terrorizing a remote highland village, and has got the, the experts baffled. Then it says, a local vet called to the scene and says, I have never seen anything like this before. There's a, a puncture wound under each ear. The wounds were so definite that at first we thought they'd been shot, but this was not the case. No blood in the body of the animal. The blood was totally gone. They really and truly believed they'd got some form of a vampire up there, and the villagers were frightened to go out after dark. I, um, Kinlochy, that's what it is, the village of Kinlochy. We contacted them, we spoke to the local vets up there, and trying to you know, find some if there was a pattern to all this sort of thing, and there's no question about it, these were animal mutilations as the form we know. Now, further down south of Scotland, we're coming now to the east coast of England, where there was a lot of UFO activity going on for a, a, a considerable period of time, and in fact some people would have heard me talk about a UFO that crashed there um, probably 12 months ago, just over 12 months ago, where witnesses saw aliens, etc., etc. And this is off the area known as Filing Dales, where the big listening station is. They have been getting animal mutilations up there now for months and months and months. May, they've got cows, uh, horses, but mainly, of course, the, the, the main stock they keep up in the fields up there are sheep. And they've been losing sheep uh, at a rate you never believe. Now, one farmer lost 40 sheep in one field. Uh, and, of course, the farmers, like the American farmers, were getting all very, very upset about this. So they, got, they decided to band together, arm themselves to the teeth, and they were going to sit in this field where this main thing was happening, and they were going to blast anything that moved. Make no mistake about anything that moved was going to get shot. So they all get in this field this night, and they're waiting. But they got a surveillance firm in, and they actually mounted cameras on three positions in this field, and they were triggered to infrared beams. So anything moving would trigger the beams, and hopefully they get some photographs. In the middle of the night, suddenly these cameras started to flash. They, in fact, they flashed three separate occasions during the course of the night. Now, when dawn broke, when morning came, they found a dead sheep in the field, the very field they stood in, and it wasn't more than 10 yards from their position. Now, one of the people there, in fact, one of my contacts, he was wearing, his watch he was wearing at the time stopped at 4.30 that morning. And he said, that watch has never gone again since that time. He's had to buy a new watch. Now, they sent a carcass of a sheep for autopsy to one of the top professors in this country on um, uh, veterinary sciences. 
And he sent a 40-page report back to my contact, what he had found with this dead animal. And my contact is on the telephone reading this report out to me, telling me what this, briefly what this professor has said, because he says, I'll send you a copy, but basically this is what he's saying. And he got to the point, he says, the sheep was radioactive. That was number one. Secondly, the, the actual flesh structure of the sheep around the wounds was totally different. It changed. The whole molecular structure of the sheep's flesh had changed. And while he's reading this out to me on the phone, suddenly there's a bang at his door. I heard the bang. And he says, just a minute, there's somebody at the door. So he, leave, he leaves the phone off open. He says, I won't be a second. He goes over the door and he comes racing up the phone. He says, oh my God. He says, there's two police cars outside and some blokes in plain clothes. And they want him to come in. So he then goes back to the window. He says, you're not coming in this house without a warrant. I can hear him shouting at me, not coming through here without a warrant. And the next thing, he says, they've produced a the warrant to come in. So he, says, he goes back again. You know, I'm listening to all this on the telephone. And he, he says, you're not coming in this house at all. And the next thing, he comes back. He says, oh, my God, they've got crowbars. He says, I'm going to let, after 11 minutes, they're going to break the door down. Anyway, they came into the house. He phoned me back after they'd been, and they took everything he had. Um, he had several things. He had a piece of metal, which was a piece of this UFO that had come down to start with, which he was going to let me have. But he also had this report, which he, the um, analysis on the, the dead sheep. And that, they took that with him. Now, he went back to the professor who did the original report and asked if he could have another copy of it. And the professor said, don't ever come near me again over this. He said, I value my job too much. He said, I am not getting involved in this anymore. And if you mention this report to anybody else, he said, I shall totally deny that I ever did it. So that is the nature of the cover-up on this thing. And I got a telephone call only about 10 days ago from the same source on the east coast of um, England. And at that stage, 17 sheep and five badgers had been found dead. Five badgers, I mean, all, and funnily enough, the raw male badgers all dead in one field overnight and we got the same syndrome again the same mutilations now when they're boring holes in their head the, the brain and spinal cords missing that's the uh, not very pleasant I know that's the hole in the head they're not very pleasant pictures I know but it just gives you some idea of what is That incidentally, that, in, that incident, that cow there is Northern Ireland. I got these sent from Northern Ireland recently. They'll get them out in Northern Ireland as well. And I got this one sent from the same areas I'm just talking about up in the east coast of England, Filingdale's Way, only about two weeks ago. And that is a fox with a hole, as you can see, in its head, and its brain and spinal cord have gone. You see the size of the hole? It's not a bullet hole, and its rectum has cored out. Now, what's doing this? Now, something's doing it. This, 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 thing has been, this thing has been going on since the 1960s. Nobody's ever found who's doing it. Nobody sees who's doing it. Have we got an invisible predator here or something? Anyway, that I am looking into. There's quite a few of these. Uh, that is Canadian, that one. That is American. American. They can, re they can remove the flesh off the jaw of, a, of an animal until there's just the skeleton there, and the rest of the, anim the animal's intact, totally intact. It's quite bizarre. That's the core and out where the tail, etc., is gone. Okay. Can I have the next clip of film, please? Now, this is the American police having a press conference about the animal mutilations, and this is what they're saying. that law enforcement or people have been trying to cover this up? No. I was not a three-year-old kid. You could tell that was cut away myself. But from your point of view, this was cut with a sharp instrument. I think so. And Mr. Highland was right. We cut two tissue samples from the mutilator's excision and sent them to Dr. John Altshuler in Denver. 
Microscopic examination confirmed the tissue was cut with a sharp instrument. That was the end of February, and law enforcement was busy for several more weeks checking on other mutilations and strange light reports. In Fife, Alabama, on April 7, 1993, the Fife Police Department held its first official press conference about animal mutilations. Media came from Alabama and surrounding states. Beginning in November of 1992, the Fife Police Department has been conducting an investigation into unexplained cattle mutilations. We've been doing this with cooperation of local police departments and other law enforcement agencies. These reported incidents began on October 20th, 1992, and have continued through last week in Marshall and DeKalb counties. To date, over 30 animals have been discovered dead in pastures, with various internal and external organs missing. The incisions examined on these animals exhibit precise surgical cutting. In many of the cases, there has been evidence of extremely high heat on the tissue samples. <coughs> Dr. Jim Armstrong, Auburn professor of zoology and wildlife science, agrees with us. He states, quote, it would be obvious if a coyote had been tearing through. The wounds would not be similar to a smooth cuts. Coyotes bite through and pull and tear away at the flesh. It would have a chewed on look. There are other scavenger animals such as vultures that will eat at the softer regions of a cow, but there's not going to be these clean surgical type cuts. There is no way a coyote or other predator inflicted those wounds. Can you speculate what type of high heat source would do that? And any idea that the, did the uh, universities give you any indication? Speculation or hypothesis are not part of our criminal investigation. Uh, we're not going to guess on what's happening. All we're going to do is base our conclusions on the evidence that we've gathered and from witness testimony. We don't know what the uh, source of the high heat is, but we certainly would like to know what's inflicting damage in excess of 300 degrees on the tissue of these animals. What do you think? I have no idea what's doing it to these animals. But I think we should find out. Is that, do you think that's possible to find out? I think it's been going on for so long across the nation? If you look at the statistics, I think our chances of catching a perpetrator are going to be very difficult. But if we don't, this will never try. What would you tell people with this information? What would you tell farmers who are scared to report this? Now that this is out, what do you hope people walk away from here with? They can report their animals anonymously. We want to get the information about the case. We want tissue samples from the animals if it's a fresh kill. We want to take pictures of it. We want to have professional analysis done of any evidence that could be recovered from the scene. We want to help the farmer, but we can't do it unless he contacts his local law enforcement agency and requests that somebody come out and take a look at his animal. On June 16, the last reported Alabama mutilation in 1993 occurred at a farm in New Harmony. Round circles of tissue had been taken around each teat. The rectum was cored out and the cow's jaw tissue had been stripped. Local cattle farmer A.D. Hodgins told the Weekly Post newspaper, I couldn't have done that smooth a job with a razor blade. Okay. So that is the, um, the American police uh, sort of answer to it at that stage in the game. Now in 1960, I'm sorry, in 1985, an investigative group in the United States headed by a retired U.S. Army major was so concerned about this, they'd been collating information about this particular thing from all over the world. And they actually sent a document to every U.S. senator about this syndrome. And basically what the document said it says, from 1967 to the present day, normally reliable U.S. investigative bodies have found nothing close to the answer to these animal mutilations. So far, the perpetrators of these, this criminal conspiracy against American U.S. livestock have remained unidentified. Eighteen years of investigation have failed to uncover one shred of evidence or have failed to produce one shred of evidence. Shall we use this to condemn with shame the performance of the authorities, or are we in confrontation with some unidentified alien forces whose advanced strategy not only outwits the United States, but the rest of the world as well? And one of the senators sent a letter back to them, and it was, which I found particularly interesting. It says, thank you for your letter and for the enclosed documents regarding the mutilation of livestock. I have read your memorandum with great interest and I am intrigued by its conclusions. Please be assured that I will keep your views in mind when the President's Strategic Defense Initiative is considered on the House floor. So we're talking about SDI. 
The, the major and these group, they sent these, this and a, a wad of other documents to every senator in the United States, and there's no question they came down firmly on the side this is being done by some form of ET. And so they come back with, um, we'll bear it in mind when we're talking about the Strategic Defense Initiative, which is, I find interesting. Anyway, there was a bond put up of $500,000 at that time to the first person who could come forward forward with evidence uh, which would result in the capture of the perpetrators of these offences. That $500,000 has never been claimed to this day and it's still there for the first person to come up with the answer. So that is it as far as the animal mutilations are concerned, ladies and gentlemen. There's a lot more to it than that, but I am on a tight sort of time schedule and I want to talk about the, um, the cups and sauces which I've been asked about once or twice. And we'll go straight on to that now. Some considerable time ago, when I say considerable time ago, about five years ago, two Liverpudlian men, two taxi drivers from Liverpool, came by some golden coloured cups and saucers. Um, one of them purchased them cheap, it was almost like a car boot sale they bought, but it was actually a street market type of thing. One of these old street markets they have in the uh, north of England, you know, particularly up in the Liverpool and Leeds and uh, our areas. And he saw these things on a, a, a stall there, and um, he said that it was some sort of oriental gentleman who was selling them, and he said he, went, he was attracted by them for some reason, or I don't know why. And he asked him how much he wanted for them. And this chap says, you can have them for five quid. So he says, great, give him a five, he gets them the cups and saucers. There are four cups and eight saucers, all made of a metallic substance. Now, when you look at them on face value, you've got four little light teacups on four little saucers. Now, if you get, take a saucer in your hand and put one hand on the top and one on the bottom and screw most of them, one saucer will turn into two saucers. One comes away from the other, but I defy you to tell them when they're together. So you then end up with four cups and eight saucers. Now, what happened was he brought these things home. He said with the intention, he said, I don't know why I bought them. He said, they weren't particularly attractive. He said, but I, I don't know, I had this compulsion to buy them. He bought the things, brought them home, and then didn't know what to do with them. So he then decided he'd put them in a box in his garage. He said, I'm not putting them up as ornaments in the house. He said, so he puts them in this box and forgets them. And one day he's at home doing some do-it-yourself. His wife's at work and he's looking after his three-year-old youngster. And the youngster's being fractious. He's crying and shouting and bawling. And uh, anyway, he goes out into the garage to get some tools to, consider his, uh, to continue with his do-it-yourself. And he suddenly spots this box with these cups and saucers in. So he brings them into the house and gives them the youngster to play with. He thought they might keep him quiet for a few minutes. Within very, very quick time, this youngster, who, from being crying and shouting, was, is sitting laughing hysterically. So he, the father says, what, what, you know, what's, some, you know, what's the sudden change of uh, sort of temperament? And the little lad is pointing at it. He said, man. And what basically happening, this is according to the man who got the plate. There was a light shining through the window of the house, sunlight, a shaft of sunlight shining through the house, um, the French window at the back of the house. And it was actually playing on one of these saucers. And there was a hologram standing out of this saucer. And this is how we found out about this thing. Now, over a period, they kept, these two, him and his mates, they kept this quiet for a long time, and they played about with these things, and they put lights on, and they did all sorts of things, and they came up with about, I don't know, must have 500 photographs of different things which have come from these plates. At this moment in time, they are creating controversy. There is an argument. There's some people who've seen them who say that they're, they're at least 20,000 years old. Um, they had a thing called Schofield's Quest where these plates appeared on there. Well, it was the biggest farce you'll ever come across because the, it, was, it ended up to be about a 10-minute program, apparently. They had one so-called scientist on there who turned around and said, these plates, he said, this type of thing were made 100 years ago in Birmingham. Now, he said they were made on a lathe. He told them what the plates were made of. And he gave them this sort of, so much uh, zinc, so much copper, da, 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 da. And then it turns out that when they'd had a look at these plates and analysed them, they got the analysis totally wrong because this chap had been cleaning these plates with metal polish. And these gave them, they put zinc on, onto them. So when they took a piece of one of these and analysed it, they got, found that it had a, one of the constituents was zinc, and it, which it wasn't. It was part of the metal polish that had done it. So they got the whole thing wrong. Now, the thing about it is, that is um, a magnified view of the edge of one of these saucers. Now, I don't know whether you can see, it's very difficult from where I'm standing, 
But if you could see that closely, uh, where's me? Um, let's see. That there, that is all people. Dozens and dozens of people, all carved out along the sides, and it's almost like a biblical scene on it. I don't know whether you can see. I don't know if, from your point of view. Even. So anyway, that is on the edge of uh, some of these sources. Now. This thing has been to and fro and etc. over a period of time. Now we had a, um, a, a mini conference in Leeds a few weeks ago where these two chaps came and they brought these cups and saucers. Now I'd been, I'd been to their home and I'd seen them because when they phoned me up and told me about this I didn't believe it. I was a bit straight. I said look, I, I, I'll, I'll believe this when I see it. Come to the house and we'll show you. So I went with my son-in-law. They duly got these things out and they were using artificial lights because you know you couldn't just rely on the sun. And they actually had holograms standing off these plates. We saw it with their own eyes. Then I believed it. Um, so then we had this function at, uh, our, it's usually our home venue in the Centenary House a few weeks ago where we had a couple of hundred people there. And these two lads came and they were on a, a stage the same as this. Um, and they'd never ever given a lecture in their life before so they were extremely nervous to start with. And they, halfway through the lecture, they tried to get these things and they were trying to shine lights on it. And we found that we got the wrong light for the job. We needed a light with a beam on. We hadn't got a light with a beam there. And the whole thing turned out to be chaotic. And, of course, people who came, they said, hey, look, we wanted to see the holograms. This is not right. This is, you know. And, and it was unfortunate. It was, a, it was a bad experience. Now, some of the people who were at that conference then asked these chaps who got the plates, could we see these things sort of in a private situation? You know, and he said, no trouble at all. So half a dozen got together, they went to these chaps, they got the plates out, did the necessary with the lights, and they got the holograms. And they were oh, absolutely delighted. So the next thing, in that same meeting where we had the problems, there were several people in the audience we didn't know were sat there who were related or attached to certain universities. And one doctor, the uh, doctor male, doctor female together, uh, we're sitting at the back of the thing, watching these, the, uh, because they were actually putting pictures on the screen, of course, as well, of photographs they'd taken. And immediately, some of the images they saw in these photographs, they recognized them as identical images to what they were on very, very ancient artifacts. So they immediately wanted to get their hands on these things for York University to analyze them. Now, in the meantime, the American Encounters program got on to me and says, look, we want to do a program about these plates. Can we come and see them first to see what they do? And I said, well, it isn't up to me. It's up to the person who's got the plates. But I contacted the people with the plates, and they said, yes, send them. Tell them they can come. And there was arrangements made. So the Encounters program arrived at the home of these two men. And they were given a demonstration. And the Encounters people were suitably impressed. They phoned me up afterwards and said, it's God was beat. We've never seen anything like this in our life. So they said, we want to take them back to America. The two men with the plates, back to America, we will put the top NASA uh, hologram specialists onto these, let them use their very sophisticated equipment, and let's see what they can get out of these, because the mind boggles. If these two men can do this with a normal light, what the hell can these experts do with their real... So, great. I said, well, oh, smashing. Now, the next thing I get is the encounters man comes back onto me again, and he's, he's very upset. York University have phoned him direct and told him to keep his hand up our artifacts. We want them for England. We're not having our artifacts taken out of this country to America where we no doubt they will disappear. So he phones up and he's very, very upset about this. He said, look, I am not a thief. I don't want to take these and take them out of your hands so you won't get them back. All I want to do is take them there for analysis with the top people in the field and to make a film on it, of course. He said, but they can take the plates back with them. But York University will not have this at all. They said, if those plates and cups and saucers leave this country, we will never see them again. So that's the way it is at this moment in time, in some sort of limbo, so I don't know just how far they've got with them, but I'll go on with what we've got here, first of all. Oh. When I told you about me getting slides in the wrong thing, I've got that one upside down. So your hologram is going downwards instead of upwards. You wouldn't believe that, and it's one of the, it's one of the main ones. Is it possible to rectify that one? If I, can I go back? Oh, hold on, I've gone back. I can assure you one thing, ladies and gentlemen, 
These are the most remarkable things I've ever seen. Now the thing is, if the dating of these things, which they're saying is anything up to 20,000 years old, is true, can you see it? The greys in the... Well, that's exactly what our abductions have been describing under hypnosis. And that's a hologram out of one of these sources. Yet they're saying they're 20,000 years old. How do we get this technology in something 20,000 years old? We can't do this today. So, they've got a quandary because these two chaps who've got these plates, have, as I say, have taken hundreds and hundreds of photographs of them. Now, the thing about it is these photographs seem to start way, way back in time at the time of the pyramids or even before that. And they depict the pyramids not as being made by the ancient Egyptians, but by a race of aliens. Um, which is very, very interesting, because I could digress there. I don't know whether there's possibly people in the audience who do know, but I received some information only recently from a friend of mine in the States, it was actually Colin Andrews, and he was being talking to one of uh, America's leading scientific archaeologists who'd been going out to the Great Pyramids. And uh, they've been going and returning and going regular way, these scientists. But they've, so, I don't ask me, ask me how, I've only got them very, very briefly, but they've actually worked out that the pyramids are actually formed on some sort of harmonic frequency inside the chambers. They, 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 they measured, you know, all the size of the chambers and the location and exactly where these uh, chambers were within the Great Pyramid of Giza. And they said that they actually worked to an absolute frequency of harmonics, these. So as a result, they did months and months of work on this apparently. Get back to the States once they got these were definitely part of the harmonic frequency and they came back and brought instruments with them this second time. And they took all these instruments to this uh, pyramid and they, don't, I'm no scientist, but apparently they actually focused these in, instruments onto the harmonic um, mathematical equation inside the pyramid and set them, activated them. And there was a crowd of scientists, apparently up to 20 scientists there, and suddenly, while they were standing there in this chamber, a figure walked through the wall of the pyramid at one side, right across the front of them, in front of them, and out through the wall at the other side. And the next thing, a huge uh, block of granite which was in this chamber suddenly elevated off the floor and was hanging in the air. And then the next thing on top of that was certain hieroglyphs started to appear on the walls of the inside of the pyramid which weren't there or weren't visible before. And I think this, uh, all this stuff they were getting as a result of this, it, it to totally blew their mind. Anyway, they're back in America now, and they're going to go back again, apparently, with much more instrumentation. But what they, it, the bottom line of it looks now, because of this, that exactly what I've just been saying, the pyramids were not put there by the ancient Egyptians, but they were put there by an alien race before. And that's what this harmonics thing is proving. So I thought I'd just add that at the, at the time of this, about this one. This is just a look at one of them. Now you see those dark marks on them? They're not always there. You put a light on them, they suddenly start to appear. And if you look at certain ones of them, they'll show you planetary systems, configurations of stars. Now I can't see from here, but you should be able to see some form of a picture there on that one. Bearing in mind these are photographs of what they were getting on the plates. That is just the, I saw one of these saucers. You've got your centered part at the bottom of the saucer and then the curved part comes up at the side. And I saw them play lights on one of these saucers and hold the light there and it changed from that color to bright green and then to bright blue just while they focused the light on it. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. It was quite, quite amazing. Now that is a, a, a close up magnified, even closer of the saucers and they're almost rimmed like a, a, one of the old 78 gramophone records. But each rim, apart from the, the sort of the circular thing, there are small ones in between all these. Very it's amazingly intricate stuff on these, these things. I just don't know. Because that's another picture they've taken out. I think there's a picture on it somewhere. Yeah, on the top there's one in the... Uh, No, oh, that's sideways on. Can you? Can, can you see it, Graham, from there? 
if you, can, if you can stand it up straight up. That's it. That's a picture on the uh, one of the pictures they've taken off them as well. How you can get these off a small metal plates like this, it, it beats me. But there they are. That's it. For what it is. Now, that's the last slide. Well, it's now nearly 10 to 6, ladies and gentlemen, so I'm going to draw this to a close because we are going to have a question and answer period after this. I'm very uh, grateful for you listening to me, and thank you very much indeed. Interesting, isn't it? Ladies and gentlemen, 10 minutes, 15 tops, chance to get a last cup of tea.